Hunger Clubs webinar. This is the fourth one in our series now. We've covered uh, quite a few topics and uh, we're really excited that Football West can be able to cover important topics for clubs. It's really the theme of clubs helping clubs, having the leaders in our football community be able to share ideas and motivate and provide some inspiration for different programs around the football community in WA. It's a really good timing as well because it's a disability inclusion round coming up this weekend uh, through the Football Futures Foundation. We're really excited to be welcoming some fantastic guests tonight. And, and firstly, uh, I will throw to Chris Barty, who's a Pararoo himself and also the um, ambassador for Football Futures Foundation. Chris, it's a real pleasure to have you and excited to have you host uh, what should be a really informative night. Cheers, we'd really appreciate uh, your time and, and thanks very much uh, to Football West for putting on this event and um, and also the Football Futures Foundation as well for, for spearheading uh, disability inclusion round uh, this year for what I think is the first time. So um, two good things happening in, in disability football at the moment, so really um, pleased to be part of this roundtable discussion um, or, or digital roundtable discussion as it were, so um, yeah, really pleased to be part of it. Um, so tonight, uh, what we're going to do is just uh, start by introducing some of the, the kind of the key concepts when we look at inclusion um, in, in football in, in Western Australia and specifically looking at inclusion through a disability lens. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off proceedings just by going through, as I say, kind of the, the broader principles. And then um, throughout the evening, we'll have uh, Sue Minatillo from, from Special O, uh, Special Olympics. Uh, we'll have uh, Kim representing uh, the Equal Footing Ball uh, program and then Raquel from Blind Sports WA sharing some insights from, from their program as well. Um, and then it uh, be great to have a discussion with, with each of you about uh, each of the programs that, that you're running uh, and then it'll be an opportunity for us to have some reflections uh, at the end. So um, if that sounds good, uh, then let's get let's get underway. Uh, so if you just bear with me for one moment while I bring up the, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so if I can just get a uh, thumbs up that we can all sort of see, see that, that that's all okay. Great, so I assume, that, I assume that's going well. Um, so uh, just to start things off, as I said, um, what we'll do is first of all just give you a bit of a bit of background about myself and and you know why it is that I get to be the one that sort of uh, sits here and, and give you a little bit more about uh, about disability inclusion in football, um, introducing the concept of inclusion um, and why it's important. Um, but really, the meat of of kind of the introduction to the session will be around looking at the seven pillars um, of inclusion, which were put together by uh, by Fair Play uh, Australia. Uh, we'll have a look at this through the lens of um, football in in Western Australia to give us a bit of a, a bit of local context um, and and specific context to our sport, uh, and then that'll kind of hopefully set the agenda for the rest of the evening where we'll get to hear from um, our various programs um, that are happening happening around the state. Um, we'll find out, and then finally at the end of the presentation, we'll find out where we can find out some more information for clubs and programs that are wanting to become more involved in um, developing um, inclusive programs uh, in in their in their clubs, um, or um, looking at how they can become more involved in um, supporting football to become um, hopefully the premier inclusive sport in in Western Australia. Uh, so a little bit about myself. So. Um, I, as a as a footballer, I came to football relatively late, um, but uh, at uh, the age of age of 21, uh, and uh, that was through a referral from a, a physiotherapist. Um, so essentially, um, went through a an assessment on a physio bench, um, had a bit of a chat with a physio who identified that uh, that I had the, the flexibility of an 85 year old, and um, at the age of 21, that probably wasn't a great um, outcome. But one of the ways that I had the opportunity to um, improve um, my my physical mobility was through participating in football. Um, I've played um, in a number of different um, spheres and a number of different varieties of, of the game. Um, first of all, starting just with Monday Night Futsal with a, a group of a group of friends from uh, high school and, and university, um, right through to playing playing at the elite level um, with the Pararoos at uh, at the most recent World Cup. Um, in Spain. So um, through football, I've had the opportunity, I suppose, to have a look at um, the sport through a number of different lenses, which has been which has been exciting. 
Uh, off the field, um, sport and in particular um, inclusive, inclusive sport has been a particular passion, passion of mine, um, both in, a, uh, in an education sense and, and in a professional sense. Um, probably highlighted, I suppose, by um, a master's project that I completed back in 2014, um, which explored how to engage people with physical disabilities uh, in sport and recreation, um, particularly looking at the different communication strategies that we can use to kind of uh, encourage people with physical disabilities in particular to participate in sport and recreation. So um, that project, I suppose, provided me with some with some key learnings that uh, hopefully I can, can share some of those tonight um, as well. Um, but we're not really here for me, which is which is great. What what we are here for is to have a broader conversation about what it, what inclusion is generally. Um, and there are um, sort of two definitions here which are provided about what inclusion looks like in the sporting space. Uh, so the first definition is brought to us by Sport Australia, which is of course um, the federal government body which looks after sport uh, in Australia, and they define inclusion as providing a range um, of options to cater for people of all, back, all uh, ages, uh, abilities and backgrounds um, in the most appropriate manner possible. Uh, and so this is a really uh, quite a broad de definition of, of what inclusion means. So for me, I always like to go to the, the next layer uh, of, of detail, which I think is really well provided um, by the um, guys at uh, Play By The Rules or the team at Play By The Rules. Um, and they indicate that uh, inclusion is um, a series of proactive behaviours, um, action, uh, options and actions um, to make people from all backgrounds, ages and abilities feel welcome, respected um, and that they belong at your club. And what we're going to do um, over um, the next, uh, next piece of the presentation is really kind of look at you know, what are some of those proactive behaviours that we can look at when seeking to include people um, in, in our clubs? Um, what are some of the options that we can provide people with, with disability when they're seeking to participate in football? And then finally, what are the actual physical actions that we can take to make sure that um, uh, people from all backgrounds, but particularly given that this is um, uh, disability inclusion, inclusion around here in, in, in football in WA, looking at that specifically for people with, with disability. So what are the steps we can actually take to, to make that happen so that they feel, belong, they feel as though they belong and are respected at, at your club? But before we begin, uh, we want to have a bit of a look at why um, inclusion is important anyway. And I always think it's not uh, good to provide um, a bit of a specific example as to um, as to why this is the case. Uh, so we we know that um, uh, people with disability aged between uh, 15 to 19 um, are more likely to experience sadness, loneliness um, or isolation. Um, they're more likely to experience psychological distress um, and they are generally less optimistic about their future um, employment prospects uh, after leaving school. But um, watching or participating in sport is one of the most popular ways for, pe for young people with disability to participate in the community. Um, and young people with disability um, identify their friends as an important source of support when encountering um, challenges in their daily life. So if we know that, what we know is that even though uh, young people with disability may encounter these um, additional challenges uh, above and beyond um, the, their, um, I guess, their diagnosis, um, one of the ways that they can um, uh, meet some of the challenges that they face is by forming social connections within their community. And one of the best ways that they can do that uh, is by um, taking part in uh, a sport and recreation activity. Um, and that will generally include um, you know, a range of friendships that they may form as, 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 they, as they feel comfortable. So that may include forming friendships and relationships with other people with disability. Um, it may include forming friendships and relationships with people who, um, who don't have a disability. So um, there's an opportunity to, to um, really develop that range of, range of friendships. Um, and we know that sport can provide uh, can improve people's physical, social, and economic outcomes. Um, you know, that improving the physical outcomes uh, can often be, uh, yeah, I suppose, quite obvious because sport is is a, is a physical activity which uh, helps to, um, you know, improve things like balance, strength, coordination, um, uh, motor planning, uh, you know, technique with a ball, and all those sorts of things. Um, but it equally is important uh, the social outcomes. So the opportunity to have a conversation with mates after the game, or, or you know, share a, 
uh, share a diet coke or you, you know um, or a glass of orange juice after the game and and you know chat about you know the, the highs and lows that occurred during training um, and you know what you might do better next time or what went really well um, and work together to um, to solve any kind of future challenges so that the opportunity to bond is is really important um, sport also provides an opportunity for improved economic outcomes and one of the things we mean when we talk about improved economic outcomes for people with, with disability um, is essentially the opportunity to uh, find uh, employment uh, and improve outcomes on on their resume uh, and so you know that can be as simple as um, looking at opportunities for people with disability to, to volunteer at the local club um, or it could be um, finding opportunities to uh, you know work behind the canteen or um, be an assistant coach um, at, at training sessions and things like that um, and sport sports clubs are often really good environments to do that because um, there's been that opportunity to build those relationships and that familiarity um, with the person with disability and the sporting club, um, so that when by the time you get to that conversation about having having a bit of paid employment or or, or a job, um, you know, sport can be a really good stepping stone to kind of um, uh, get that experience on the resume and then look at at broader um, employment opportunities. So, there's a bit of bit of an example of why inclusion is is important in a in a practical practical sense. The really cool part is um, that by being part of an inclusive sport program, um, you can literally change someone's life. Um, so uh, whether that is um, volunteering at a, um, a para sport program like our uh, at vision impaired program or our cerebral, cerebral palsy um, stateside, um, or simply um, uh, working within your Sunday league club um, or NPL club to provide opportunities for people with disability to participate in training um, or to participate in the broader club life, whether that be behind the canteen or um, on the committee or whatever the case may be. Um, by taking those simple steps, you can literally make a, a change, um, a significant change in someone's life by, by enacting those small steps. And what we want to do to set the agenda for this evening is to really look at some um, key ways that, that we can do that. So the first one we, we want to look at, um, or the first pillar of inclusion, uh, and there are seven pillars of inclusion that we will we'll look at. The first one is uh, attitude. Uh, and this is um, pretty simple. Uh, so essentially, as, as Benjamin Franklin says there, um, well done is better than well said. Uh, and what this means is uh, quite often um, we have really good intentions about um, being inclusive um, of people with disability uh, in our sporting clubs and sporting programs. And I think um, for any of us, if we were asked, you know, are we willing to include people with disability in our local football club, um, most people would, would put their hand up and say, yeah, of course, absolutely. It's a no brainer. But what we don't want to do is, is set about having a, a set of really good intentions uh, and a set of really good policies and plans and then have them um, have them sit on the shelf and gather dust. It's much better to um, have um, a set of a set of plans or, or, or um, policies that may not be quite perfect um, but taking some small steps and um, actions that we can then point to say point to to say we did that uh, and these actions don't have to be, grand or, um, or, or, you know, massive um, in order to be able to actually get things things going. You know, it could be something as simple uh, as, um, you know, doing, doing a, a walking tour of your club and facilities um, with someone with a disability in order to make sure that they meet physical accessibility requirements because someone um, who requires mobility aid um, will more likely be in a position to be able to tell you whether or not your, your club is, is physically accessible um, or, or not. Uh, it could also be something as simple as um, uh, having a barbecue and running an information session uh, on Autism Awareness Day in, in, in April. Um, uh, all of these sorts of things and these small steps and, and, and gestures um, are often um, great ways to start the conversation uh, about inclusion. And something that I really stress to people is that um, even though I, I identify as someone who is, was born with a disability um, and I've been playing um, international uh, 
football um, in the disability program. I've been paralyzed for the better part of 10 years. Um, I am always learning um, about inclusion and better ways to um, include people with disability um, in, in our community and in our sport programs. And I have no doubt that I'm gonna learn something from, um, from each of our guests um, this evening. The second pillar of inclusion we want to look at when we talk about uh, uh, inclusion in a football sense is access. And access can mean a number of different things. Um, but one of the things that comes to mind for a lot of people when we start talking about uh, this conversation is the concept of transport. So it's uh, when, we, when we're thinking about transport, we want to think first and foremost, is the activity or the training session or the have a go day um, or whatever it is that we're putting on, is it easy to get to? Um, you know, is it accessible by public transport? Um, you know, if it's a, if the person's going to have to drive there, um, is it a significant dif distance for them to to travel? Um, because uh, you know, the person with disability might be um, having to jump into a taxi uh, if they're unable to drive, or they might be reliant on a, a friend, um, a family member, or a carer who's taking time out of their day to to transport them to to training. To drive them to training, um, or they might be um, utilising some paid support through um, their uh, their NDIS plan um, to get them to training, which is obviously funded support, which which they're utilising, which could be going towards other things. So when we're thinking about transport, um, if we're having a uh, you know a, a state based program, um, you know where can we put it? Um, so that the majority of participants will will be able to access it. You know, so it's a relatively central location. But when we're thinking about inclusion, one of the reasons we want to make sure that as many clubs um, uh, practice in inclusive practices uh, as possible is because the more community clubs that we can have that are confident to include people with disability, you know, the, 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 the more re reduced that burden of travel is going to be because, you know, the, the person with disability will be two minutes away from a club that they're happy to, to go and participate in um, rather than two hours, um, which, is, which can be significant. Significant. We also look at things like um, physical access to the club change rooms, um, to the grandstand, um, you know, uh, parking. Um, so you know, it's it's no good um, having the the parking, uh, you know, the, ac the accessible parking bay, um, you know, sitting on a great big tree root, and then all of a sudden it's not level ground for the person who uses the wheelchair to be able to um, transfer into. So it be the ground underneath becomes uneven. So there's things like that that we want to. We want to consider as well. When we look at the playing surface and the actual game, um, you know, is the playing surface uh, appropriate? So, um, and different versions of, of football will use um, uh, different um, different playing surfaces. Um, and I won't steal the thunder about vision impaired football, but I know for myself that that, that was a you know one one of the interesting things for me is about the proximity um, with which something like cerebral palsy football, where for me. If you were if you were to take me away from um, uh, a you know the, the playing pitch and put me in a car park out the back, you know I'd be furious. But I know for for our vision impaired guys, having that silence is uh, and the ability to hear the ball is, is really important. Whereas a sport like power chair football, um, given the way that those athletes um, uh, move around the pitch, you know they're required to have access to a to a basketball court or to a hard surface rather than um, participating on grass. So thinking about the playing surface is important as well. Uh, when we're promoting our sport or program, you know, are the instructions easy to understand? So um, if um, if our athletes or our target audience, you know, our athletes um, where English is a second language, you know, do we have the capacity to provide um, the um, promotional material in a language other than English? Um, you know, if we're seeking to engage athletes with an intellectual disability, um, you know, are we putting the, the language in easy read? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a moment. Uh, finally, you know, is is the activity that we're seeking to put on uh, affordable? Uh, so um, it's it, it's probably no surprise to anyone that often costs can be um, prohibitive for people to participate in in sport. Um, but particularly uh, when you have a disability, there are often additional cost pressures, um, whether that uh, be around um, you know the, the additional support needs that someone might have. Um, the additional time that that person's carers may need to take off to, to bring them to the to the sport, um, 
there are a, a number of uh, additional pressures that, that can face people with disability in terms of finances when, when accessing sport. So the more that we can kind of reduce that burden, then the, the better off we'll be. Uh, obviously, as you kind of move up the, um, uh, I guess, the, the ladder of um, uh, uh, elite sports from the, from that community level up to the elite sport, that um, the um, emphasis then does sort of uh, go back on the athlete to be able to kind of um, find ways to, to fund their development. But, you know, that's where we would expect them to try and link in with a high performance program and, and seek support through the same channels that any, any other high performance athlete um, would, would do so. Uh, another really key pillar of inclusion is uh, around choice. Um, so there are a lot of different ways for people to um, participate in sport. Um, inclusion is when participants can choose a path that suits them. Um, and some of the examples of the choice that people might choose include um, social sport versus high performance. So social sport being where the focus is simply on um, partic participation in itself being the reward and building those friendships. Um, and developing um, those skills and the focuses on, on results are less so. Um, so some examples that we might have in in uh, football in Western Australia would be things like the Metro League or Sunday Amateurs League, Sunday Amateurs League, um, and uh, Kim and Sue will be able to, I'm sure, talk about their experiences as well. Um, you know, the type of competition that, that athletes want to participate in. So as I said, we're looking at community sp uh, specific competitions. Um, or are we looking at competitions with some integration? Um, so that would competitions with some integration um, might be uh, examples where um, athletes with disability uh, might participate alongside uh, able-bodied athletes, for example. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have um, participating in a mainstream competition. So whereby uh, athletes with a disability are participating um, essentially in an able-bodied competition. Uh, and there's no right or wrong answer um, for uh, individuals with, with disability or athletes with disability when choosing which type of football competition they would like to participate in. Ultimately, it comes down to their choice and what they feel comfortable with. What's important is that we um, have a conversation with the, with the athlete um, uh, and with their family um, about you know, what their goals are, um, what they might want to achieve and how we can support them to do that. Uh, outside of playing, of course, there are a number of different ways in which we can participate in clubs and those absolutely should remain open to people with disability as well, you know, be it, be it coaching, officiating or volunteering. Um, and again, the process remains the same, uh, understanding uh, what the person would like to achieve, what skills they can bring to the table already and where they are at their life um, at that point in time, um, and then what support the club might be able to offer to support that person to participate in a way that's meaningful for them. Um, if the club doesn't necessarily have all of the resources required to support the person with disability to participate in a, in a program, um, then it's entirely appropriate um, either to A, look for some outside um, support through Football West or Futures, Football Futures Foundation, for example, um, or if, it, if there is another um, existing club or program that runs something that is, is suitable, it's entirely appropriate to sit down with the, the athlete um, and explore those options about a possible referral onto an, um, another club or program if that's what that person chooses. Uh, our next um, pillar of, of inclusion is around partnership. So we've talked uh, a little bit already about people with disability um, being the experts in, in their own lives. And as I said, it's really impossible um, for you for you as a, as a club president or as a coach um, or as an administrator um, or as a teammate, you know, to know everything about every disability. So it's important to respect the expertise of the athlete um, as an expert in their own life. Um, and, um, you know, the example that I often use is if I'm working with a new coach um, uh, who might be new to disability football, you know, I'm trusting them to bring their football expertise because they've spent the, the, the time and energy in developing, um, you know, their skills and obtaining their C licence or their B licence or their A licence, whatever the case may be. Um, but I've spent a lifetime uh, understanding my, my own disability and, and, you know, potentially the, the disabilities of my teammates as well. So I can bring that knowledge to the table as can all of my teammates and and, um, and everybody else. Um, and if you bring the football to the table, then we can work together to, to produce some good outcomes. 
Um, when when sport works together in partnership with other organisations as well, at an organisational level, some great things happen. So in a football sense, um, you know, as I said, this might be acknowledging your own shortcomings uh, uh, and your own areas, well, I shouldn't say shortcomings, your own areas for development is probably a better way to put it, in terms of understanding about how to include athletes with a disability um, in your program. Uh, and this might include reaching out to organisations, as we said, like Football West, like the Football Futures Foundation. It could include reaching out to organisations like to the Special Olympics, uh, like Blind Sports WA, Rebound WA, um, just to name a few. Um, you know, Inclusion Solutions, um, you know, a, a number of organisations that are already operating in this space have developed um, uh, quite a considerable, um, considerable amount of knowledge and are really happy to support clubs um, take those steps from having a positive added you know having a positive um, uh, you know attitude around access and inclusion to taking positive steps to support um, access and inclusion um, if you are creating seeking to create a, 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 a an inclusive program from the beginning um, uh, or wanting to run an inclusive event um, would absolutely encourage you to do that you know the more clubs and programs that we can have, they're involved in that space, the, the better off we're going to be. Um, but one thing to remember is that um, if you're going to engage a particular um, a cohort, um, say, for example, if you're wanting to put on um, an event to, to promote cerebral palsy football, for example, then it's really important to involve people with CP um, or cerebral palsy in the design um, and delivery of that activity. Um, one of the things that we talk about in the community services space is that we do things with people, um, we don't do things to people, or we don't do things for people. Um, so it's it's very much about working alongside the community that you are seeking to include. Again, because we all have um, gaps in our knowledge and areas to improve, but the expertise often resides in the community uh, already. Uh, the next pillar of inclusion that we talk about is communication. Um, and we've spoken about some of the ways that we can promote our clubs and programs and making sure that they are easy to understand. Um, so again, looking at the different um, channels of, uh, of communication that we can use, whether it's Easy Read, um, Auslan, Braille, languages other than English. Um, but it's also important to make sure that our information is easy to find. Um, one of the things, uh, pieces of feedback that we often get from new athletes and families that join inclusive programs is, I've, I've never heard of this program, you know, I only found, found it through sheer luck um, and that sort of thing. And so we want to make sure that when we're seeking to engage with the disability community in particular, we're putting, it, putting the information in places where they're going to find it. Um, and so that might might include sharing information with trusted sources like schools, um, with um, physiotherapists, with occupational therapists. Um, it might um, ensuring that we're you know sharing information with other clubs and programs, um, co-promoting with local governments, um, you know, uh, working alongside disability service providers, um, and and uh, partnering with them to share the information. Um, so there are a number of number of different channels that we are using in order to reach the the disability audience. Um, that's it's really really critical because still today um, the number one way that people with disability find out about things is through word of mouth from other people with, with disability. So um, it's important to to get it get it out there. We also want to look at the language that we're using when talking about our inclusive program um, as well. So. Um, uh, one of the things that we we found when we did the um, the research project all those years ago was that organisations were using language like "get out of your comfort zone," um, and um, this is probably language that's not going to achieve the desired result um, because the chances are, if if you're a person with disability who's looking to participate in sport for the first time, you're already pretty far out of your comfort zone, and you, and you might be feeling some anxiety, um, and you know whether that be about you know, your own self-perception about how you're going to perform compared to how you used to before you acquired the disability, um, or you might be feeling anxious about whether or not you're going you're gonna to fit in. Um, you might be feeling anxious about whether the coach is going to um, push you too hard. Um, you know, there are a number of different things that, that can, um, uh, can already be going on behind the scenes. So what we want to do with our language, particularly in the early stages, and again, this does change as the athlete progresses 
from the community level to the elite level is to make sure that our language is um, as inviting as possible. So moving it away from things like get out of your comfort zone um, to more language along the lines of come and give it a go or come and have some fun, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then when we're, look, when we're looking at coaching um, and that sort of thing, making sure that we are providing clear, concise, concise instructions uh, that can be easily followed. Um, it's no good providing uh, writing really detailed instructions on the whiteboard with lots of arrows and X's and O's um, if you haven't laid the foundations. And even then, um, you know, sometimes your message can get lost. And that applies to all athletes, not just those with a disability. Um, it just it often just does tend to be um, uh, emphasised, I suppose, for, for our particular cohort. Um, our next pillar of inclusion is looking at policy. So um, when we're thinking about policy, uh, essentially what we want to look at is, you know, is everyone is inclusion supported by everyone at your club? You know, is it, it does it permeate throughout your organisation? Um, and where there are instances where, um, you know, inclusion and inclusive practices aren't followed, um, you know, does the athlete know who they can talk to um, or, or the channels by which they can provide feedback um, in order to um, make the change that they need to change? So if something happens that um, is inappropriate um, or perhaps we, um, we see something that could be improved, um, what's the way for the athlete to be able to, to approach that? And it's important to make sure that, that is really clear um, for the person when they walk into or walk or push or um, whatever the case may be into your club um, so that they know that they are they, they feel welcome. Um, and then uh, we're coming to coming towards the end. Um, so our, one of our last um, pillars of um, uh, Pillars of inclusion is around opportunity. So we've talked about um, reducing the barriers a little bit already, but essentially what we look at um, in, in football as much as possible, um, and I know in particular with, with programs like the, the State CP, uh, State Cerebral Palsy Program and, um, and the Equal Footing Ball Program, uh, and United Brands for that for that matter, is that it's, it's a no wrong door um, or no wrong pitch approach. And what we mean when we say that is, if you're good enough to turn up or if you're good enough to send us an email and say that you'd like to have a go, um, then uh, you are welcome to come down and, and have a kick. Um, but, uh, and, and then after, if after having a kick, you know, it turns out this isn't quite the right program um, for you, um, then there are lots of people within football that are really happy and within these inclusive programs that are really happy to um, uh, help you to be referred to, the, to a program that is more suited to your, what it is that you're after. Um, and that sort of, um, I guess, philosophy, the more that we can help that permeate throughout our clubs um, and just simply having that concept of if someone's good enough to turn up to your club to have, have, a, have a run around at pre-season training, um, you know, if, if it's not the, uh, not the um, right program for them, um, then seeking to understand what their goals and aspirations are and helping them be referred on to the right program for them, um, then that's going to be a, a long way to achieving some good outcomes. Uh, one of the things that we also look at when we think about opportunity is, is looking at, you know, certain um, adaptations that we can make to our sports. So the tree model is one that's quite common. Um, the T standing for, for teaching style. Um, so, you know, adjusting the way that we coach um, and, and the way that we communicate to our athletes. Um, you know, the rules. Um, so modifying the rules um, to provide more opportunity to play. So, and we know already there are a number of ways we can modify uh, football because we do it every training session, you know, whether that's taking 11 aside football and making it five aside or seven aside, you know, we're already modifying um, the game to achieve certain outcomes. But other things that we can adjust to are, you know, the, the playing surface that we play on, the size of the goals, um, the size of the ball, um, you know, there are lots of things that we can modify in, in order to um, include people in the activity. Um, and if, uh, and the environment as well. So, um, you know, as I said, we've talked about changing the court dimensions, but, um, you know, we also want to make sure that, um, you know, it's a, the, the environment that we're in is, is welcoming um, and supportive of people participating. Um, and one example I can give is that the recent um, IFCPF World Championships in Spain, um, you know, even at that elite level of disability football participation, um, you know, the change rooms were 50 metres away from the playing pitch and up a flight of stairs, um, which is not exactly what you want 
um, at half time. So, you know, we're, we're constantly learning and, and evaluating um, ways to improve. Um, so just before we hand over to some of our other, other guest speakers um, for this evening, so um, just wanted to leave you with some resources to, to check out in, in your own time. Um, so Fair Play Australia um, has developed a, the Play by the Rules Toolkit, which goes into more detail about the seven pillars of inclusion um, that I've, I've just spoken about and certainly something that you can um, check out in your own time uh, and, and actually start to implement at your club. Um, Swimming Australia and the National Rugby League have some terrific inclusion frameworks that can be um, leveraged and utilised by clubs um, uh, already. Uh, and then finally, um, Sport Australia has an inclusion toolkit which clubs can, again, can start to utilise straight away and adapt for their own, own purposes. So, um, yeah, really, really uh, thank you very much for tuning in and, and hope you enjoy the rest of our speakers um, this evening. So I will stop sharing my screen now. And um, hand back over to you a, a bit. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That was really That's fantastic. Um, just looking through, um, our next speaker is, I believe, Raquel from Blind Sports W8. Raquel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, I'm sure you've got a presentation you'd like to share, so feel free to take the stage. Chris, thanks very much again. That was fantastic, really informative for our clubs, and we'll make sure to um, to distribute the slides as well after this. Yeah, um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Raquel from um, Blind Sports uh, WA. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for your presentation. It was um, really informative and um, a lot of good touch points there that um, we have experienced in, in our sports and, um, and some really good information to follow up there too. So thank you. Um, so tonight I just thought I'd give you a quick rundown on um, our blind and vision impaired um, soccer program that we've been running uh, in WA this year. And um, just to discuss about some of the um, the couple of different games that we have and the pathways, and then some of the um, the positives uh, that have come out of the game and some challenges that um, we're we're facing too. So we play um, two forms of the game uh, with with um, B ones, which are people who are, are completely blind, and then the we have players that are B2s and B3s and they are, um, are not quite 100% blind, they still have some sight. So there's two quite distinct types of games um, that we have going and, and those um, two groups of people play separately, separate games. Uh, so as far as the pathways uh, that, that we have that um, people can follow, with um, blind soccer is the uh, the B ones. Um, they can um, follow the pathways all, all all the way through to the Paralympics, and the B twos and B threes um, can follow a pathway through to play the um, the World Cup. So there are um, Australian squad training camps um, around Australia, and uh, at the moment. Uh, um, uh, they're working very hard on um, recruiting women for a women's team um, to play internationally too, which is which is very exciting. So at the moment um, in WA this year, um, we've been um, developing the sport um, for the first time in WA, and we have a really good core of group of participants that um, are coming down and um, training uh, every every second Sunday, and we train at um, Perth Soccer Club. We've uh, um, establishing a really good relationship with Perth Soccer Club. Um, they have some fantastic facilities which really suit our style of, of sport. And um, we really want our participants to feel part of a club. And, um, and they have been extremely welcoming um, of us into, into the club and uh, been fantastic. Um, when we we are having a um, some social events coming up, for example, we're having a evening coming up where um, we're having it at the Perth Soccer Club, which is um, which is really great. Um, so that we have um, the coaches that we're uh, accessing for our sport um, 
again, it's as we're developing a new sport here in WA, um, there's been a lot of learning going on on um, how to communicate with uh, people with varying levels of, of sight. Um, and we found that um, the coaches that are coming down and helping us have been absolutely fantastic in being really open-minded um, uh, in learning how to engage and to communicate and give instructions to people who are blind and vision impaired. And we found that um, we it's very easy to um, to make those adaptations at a coaching level um, to help uh, teach people the sport and um, and how to you know give instructions as well. So that that's been really a really po positive for us. Um, so the key equipment that we um, need for um, for our game is um, eye shades. Um, which all of the uh, the B1 players wear um, when they're when they're playing. Um, we have uh, bell balls, so soccer balls with bells in them, and then we also use sideboards or we have um, access to inflatable fields, which um, provides a really good um, barrier uh, and includes the goals as well. So the great thing about the inflatable fields is you can take them anywhere. So we have taken them to um, other uh, sports carnivals where different forms of the game have been played. So that was really fun for our for our blind and vision impaired community to be able to play alongside um, all sorts of other clubs um, at a carnival. So that was that was really good for our guys as well this year. Um, we've we've found that um, that uh, the um, the sport is and access to being able to play um, soccer for a blind and vision impaired person um, is, is really, really positive. We found that um, our people have come out of the woodwork uh, and that, um, you know, we've known them amongst our community playing other blind and vision impaired sports, but learnt that their love is actually um, football or soccer. And um, it's been fantastic to see um, those players, you know, really come out of their shells and um, learn the game and, and just really love having the opportunity to actually play a game of soccer. Um, and I think that's really important for, um, you know, a lot of our um, modified sports is the opportunity for, for our players to actually play the game as it's meant to be played with modifications that make it safe and enjoyable and accessible for them. Um, I've, uh, I'm a parent of a 17-year-old uh, who is blind, so I've seen that um, my journey um, with her and how much, um, you know, the sport, the actual playing of the sport is really just a very small part of, um, of the whole world of playing sport. You know, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, the, the friendships and the social interaction and the, um, the uh, positive effect on her own self-esteem and, um, you know, physical and mental health is just huge. And one of the challenges that we find um, in our blind and vision impaired community is um, we really finding it challenging to reach out to children. So we had a, have a lot of, um, you know, sort of young adults and adults playing and accessing our sports, but um, we really don't have very many blind and vision impaired children under about 13 playing any sports in WA, which is, which is um, very, very frustrating because we know that these kids are out there. Um, so we'd really love to work with um, other, you know, mainstream clubs uh, and soccer clubs to, to let people know that, you know, there is this um, opportunity for blind and vision impaired um, soccer and um, soccer is such a fantastic game that is so well known by so many people um, and it's so much fun to play and so easy to play with very few modifications and not too much um, equipment in the blind and vision impaired um, realm that um, we really want to get the word out there we'd love to be able to develop um, a competition um, amongst uh, you know other clubs um, in and also love to run some um, some uh, competitions within, um, you know, different types of clubs like the CP community, um, for example, and the Special Olympics community. Um, be awesome to be able to play some games um, against the different different clubs as well. Um, so one of the big things we I think we find, especially with um, children uh, getting children along to sports, is is the transport um, and access to the sport. Um, you know, often the clubs are few and 
far between um, that are offering, um, uh, you know, inclusion for, for our disabled community. So um, parents often have to drive a long way um, to get their kids. And unfortunately, what I think happens a lot is that once kids sort of hit that sort of middle to late primary school age, they just get dragged along with their siblings um, who played able-bodied sports and they tend to miss out on playing um, their own form of the sports, which to me is just is, is absolutely heartbreaking. So I would love to work together with you all um, to try and really bridge that gap and work out how we can get um, a lot more players of all abilities um, into playing our sports. Thank you. Raquel, thank you so much. I think it was so fascinating that you mentioned that there's a dearth of children um, who are blind and vision impaired involved in sport. That's really laid a challenge to us in the football community. And there was a lot that resonated with what Chris was, was talking to us about with access and opportunity. So we really appreciate and we also look forward to working much closer with you and, and seeing more more clubs embrace um, the opportunities that come with, with that version of football. Uh, one program that has really got a strong footing in WA is Equal Footing Ball. Really excited that we've got with us uh, Sue Minus Hillo, who's from Coburn City. And she brings with us a perspective of that competition, but also from a parent's point of view as well which is which is really refreshing and unique so we look forward to hearing from Sue and uh, and welcome to you. Thanks so much. Yes so I'm Sue Minutillo and I'm the team manager for the Coburn Equal Footing Ball um, division. Um, what can I say about Equal Footing Ball? Fantastic program um, started 12 years ago with six athletes, believe it or not. And last count, I had a look today, we're up to 65, uh, spread across five different clubs. Uh, Coburn currently has around 25 athletes competing. And I can't even begin to tell you how proud I am to be part of such a supportive club in Coburn City. Um, our president, Heidi Lazaro, 12 years ago said yes to this program, embraced the program, the club, all the supporters, all the sponsors, everyone there has supported us for 12 years now and Equal Footing Ball just grows and grows each and every day. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background, it has currently three divisions. Um, we have Kim James with us today, he's the Lingwood coach for Equal Footing Ball and um, he will tell you that we're constantly trying to find new players um, and improve the competition. With the three divisions, we're actually looking at a fourth, believe it or not, um, because the competition is just growing so, so much and we have different degrees of disability and ability in the actual program itself. So you can all stay tuned for that extra division that will probably be happening very, very soon. I suppose the biggest problem we have is getting the word out there. Um, Chris, you touched on the fact that we uh, have our have new people or new players turn up all the time, and it's always through word of mouth or through parents going to um, the schools and talking about equal footing ball and how um, their child can get on board. Um, I think, if anything, we need to try and get the word out there more. Um, and we we would love more clubs in equal footing ball. We really would. We've got five at the moment and we're constantly asking for more. Um, and I ca can't even begin to tell you how much it changes a club once you have a team in there of players um, playing the game of football most times, really, you can't even tell the difference between an able-bodied team and, you know, a team of our disabled athletes. And that's the beauty of it. But probably the best thing about it is the sense of community, the sense of family, 
our families come to Equal Footing Ball and, you know, watch their kids get out there, play with their friends, physical activity, you, you really can't even explain how happy they all feel and how happy we are to have them all. Um, with Equal Footing Ball, you'll find that you register with your club, you train with your club, and then you play matches, and we play matches every fortnight. Um, we have pathways, and Kim will go more into Special Olympics, which is a pathway for our athletes with intellectual disabilities. And, of course, we have the marvellous WA Paras, and um, the, that, that team is a state team focusing basically on, on players with cerebral palsy and acquired brain injury. So we always are constantly looking at our players and seeing if we can put them into our pathways or into other programs. And as Chris explained, when a, when a child or adult turns up to equal footing ball, because we will take anybody from nine onwards, we always ask them what they're after, what they're wanting to do, and seeing if the Equal Footing Ball program fits them because it is a program and a division specifically for players with disabilities only. Um, if they're more in wanting to get into, say, a mainstream team, no problem. Um, perhaps they want something like United Reds, which is a mixture. Uh, if they have an intellectual disability and want to go higher and want to play nationals or internationally, you've got Special Olympics and the WA Paris as well. So there's a whole um, a range of programs out there for people with disabilities and for athletes with disabilities. Personally, um, I don't mind talking about my son, who's, you know, part of quite a few programs, both <laughs> WA Paras, Special Olympics, equal footing ball and you know Chris walked in at, at 14, 14 years old and you know we we sort of walked into equal footing ball as something to do during the winter months and 10 years down the track you know Chris has played for the state nationally internationally and we've watched him grow um, into a very confident everybody knows he's very confident <laughs> Um, athlete who loves the game, loves his friends, loves the social aspect of it, but most importantly, he gets from it um, a sense of belonging, and that's so important for our for our young people with disabilities and for any person with a disability. Um, so I, you know, have had the pleasure of volunteering for all the different programs over many years now and from a personal perspective you know if you had have said to me 10 years ago I'm not really one who really was into her sport um, whether you know that I'd be doing this 10 years later um, from a personal point of view I can't even begin to tell you how satisfying it is and how much I enjoy it and how much I love watching um, a young player turn up to equal footing ball who can hardly kick a goal and ends up representing his state in something like Special Olympics or the WA Paris or just going out there on a Sunday and playing a match with his friends. Um, so I would encourage any club to join, any club to join the equal footing ball family in particular and, um, you know, watch your club embrace such a fantastic program. That's it from Thank me. You, <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Uh, Sue Minatillo from Coburn City. Uh, a huge thank you because you did mention the volunteering aspect of it, and, and it is. It's a labour of love. And we thank Coburn City for supporting the program and the other clubs in Equal Footing Ball who do so. 
it has introduced players to the pathway. And that's a really good segue to Kim James, who comes from Linwood United and is the coach there. But he will introduce us to the player pathways in Special Olympics. So thanks for joining us, Kim. You're just on mute, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction there. It's uh, it's fantastic to be here and uh, having the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Special Olympics uh, Western Australia program. Um, it's a pretty exciting program. As uh, Sue touched on briefly, we uh, pretty much feed our uh, Special Olympics program via our equal football division. Um, and uh, as as stated, I'm, a, I'm the coach for Linwood United. And uh, that's just been a great program. Started, or I got involved mainly because of my son. Uh, we wanted to be involved in a, for, a sporting opportunity, and uh, that was provided to us several years back, about seven years ago, uh, where we went down and we started playing uh, soccer with Linwood United. Uh, and then, unbeknownst to me, I became the coach of Linwood United, uh, starting out about seven years ago with uh, two to three players. And uh, we're currently the uh, second team behind Coburn now with 17 active players, uh, one trialling at the moment, uh, and obviously each day looking to grow. Um, but from my own perspective, I'm here to talk about Special Olympics and the program we have running in WA at the moment. Um, very unique program. Uh, uh, the main thing we focus on here with the Special Olympics side of the world is uh, intellectually disabled uh, athletes. Uh, so um, there is a leaning or, or discussions at the moment through Special Olympics Australia where we're looking at autism. Um, a lot of uh, parameters there and that's still being negotiated out at the uh, global governing body. Uh, which will then be transferred across the national body, which will then be transferred across the uh, the state bodies uh, throughout Australia. If that decides to go ahead, uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see on that one. And uh, we haven't had too much updates lately on that. So basically in WA, we have 27 active athletes uh, that I'm actually aware of at the moment. Sometimes we get a few more that come up there. We don't get updates on them and suddenly they turn up to training and it's, a, it's actually fantastic to welcome them into our community. Um, so how the program works, uh, we generally uh, have an open door policy with Special Olympics WA or Special Olympics Australia in which an athlete can express an interest or a participant uh, that wants to come down and have a go in, the, in a number of different uh, 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 sporting programs we have through Special Olympics. So football isn't the only thing we do. We also have uh, uh, athletics, swimming, uh, equestrian, ballroom dancing is a new sport. Um, they're trialling, I believe, AFL football uh, at the next uh, national games we'll be hosting uh, and uh, several other sports. So uh, obviously we're here to talk football, which is what I'll try and focus on now and not get excited and go off rambling about other sports and that sort of stuff. But uh, Chris mentioned early in his talk about the ability to get people involved and uh, becoming an inclusive environment. Well, I think Special Olympics really nails it on the head because we're constantly looking for new sports, new opportunities uh, to give the people in that community that uh, are slowly disadvantaged through an intellectual disability an opportunity to grow into a uh, an opportunity they never even thought existed. Uh, so I think that's that's a great uh, I think a great philosophy for the, for the Special Olympics program. Um, so what we generally do with our um, our athletes from Special Olympics. Uh, we filter them through at a, via a pathway of the equal football division. Uh, and as Sue indicated, we have division one, two and three within our um, uh, equal footing ball program. Primarily our athletes for um, Special Olympics are filtered via the uh, division one program, which are our guys that are literally playing for sheep stations. So it's a very, very competitive environment. Uh, and uh, as Sue pointed out, sometimes if you come down to watch a game, um, the delineation between a mainstream player and our uh, SO uh, Division One players, it's actually at times quite hard to uh, differentiate between the two. So it's a, a very high level of competition. Um, so once we've selected our players or, or they've been invited into the Special Olympics program, um, we'll then give them a, a, a training where available. We also do come and try days where we get people to come down and have a go at uh, just to have a bit of an experience with it to see if it's something they want to continue on with. And then they're allowed to register into the Special Olympics program. Um, we generally try to run uh, state games on a on a, a, tw a two yearly uh, program. Uh, we just had the last ones in October last year, uh, and from there uh, we looked at filtering our athletes through to the national games, uh, which we'll be conducting this year in Launceston uh, from about October 15 through to 21, I believe, off the top of my head, in which we're taking two five-a-side teams across this year. 
Uh, unfortunately, COVID's caused a bit of uh, chaos across the country in trying to get our numbers up uh, and enabling every state to actually participate in the national games. Um, so at this stage, I believe we've got four states that are actually actively have teams involved. Uh, WA, we've got two teams that are going across, and we'll call them, for want of a better definition, a, a uh, an A and a B side. So um, uh, Sue's husband, Sav, will be running the uh, seven, or what's traditionally the seven-a-side team, or our, I suppose, our A-level players. Uh, and I'll be taking across the uh, our, our B-level players, I suppose. Um, they go through a pretty intense divisioning process uh, to allocate them into an equal competition when we get there. Uh, so when the guys and players get across for their first game, sometimes they get completely uh, demoralised because they might get completely cleaned up by a, a more stronger team from another state. However, the divisioning process ensures that by the time the players get towards their actual competitive matches for the for the national games, it's a, it's a, an incredibly well-balanced tournament. It's, a, it's actually fantastic to see. Um, I think personally for myself, having my son involved, uh, the most rewarding aspect of the Special Olympics program, uh, and this is something I joke around with a lot of people, particularly our mainstream footballers and uh, our elite players that potentially sometimes, dare I say it, lack a little bit of humility, to come across and watch the athletes in the Special Olympics National Games and the way they carry on towards each other, the way they treat each other, the respect, the humility, uh, and the sportsmanship is just something that will, it's its it, it, it's mind-boggling. It is absolutely mind-boggling and, and, and so humbling to be a part of. It's actually really, really rewarding. Uh, the most exciting thing we do have uh, uh, in the works, in the background, that we're hoping that we'll see a bit more uh, media coverage pretty soon is uh, uh, the, our wonderful city of Perth is looking to host the, uh, or is currently in the process of bidding for the 2027 World Games. Um, so if that comes off, uh, which we believe it's looking very good, um, the Special Olympics World Games is actually one of the biggest events on the face of the earth when it comes to participation. Um, for example, the Olympics Games generally has about probably, I think, 2,000 odd uh, participants involved with it. Um, Paralympians is a little bit more, I think about 3,000, but the average Special Olympics World Games has over 5,000 participants and support people uh, involved in the activity. So. Uh, if, if WA gets that, it's going to be a fantastic opportunity. And more importantly, once we do the uh, national games uh, in 2026 to select our uh, national teams, uh, the most exciting part for uh, us in the equal football division competition that support Special Olympics uh, and have our own kids involved in that, uh, we, our understanding is that host cities are enabled to enter a team or a local team within that World Games environment. and. To me, the thought that my son with an intellectual disability is potentially going to play for Australia is the most rewarding and unbelievable. Um, uh, I, I don't know how I'm going to handle that. I might be a ball of tears on the night, I reckon, so, <laughs> if it should go ahead. So uh, that's something we're really, really excited about. Um, so I guess I've really talked about uh, the pathways and what we're about. Um, I guess, uh, as Sue pointed out, our pathways are from the equal football division and uh, uh, some of the issues we have, I guess, towards the future, uh, not only for Special Olympics, but also for equal football division, I suppose, uh, would be the issue of volunteer burnout. Um, we have a key, uh, I suppose, core of volunteers that put a lot of work into the programs, um, but I guess it'd be great to see new people coming through to support that. And uh, I suppose a wider community approach to that, potentially through Football West support as well, which would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, our growth, whilst we are growing, it is a very slow growth. Um, uh, an example of, of, uh, of that is Linwood United as an EFD club. We started about seven years ago with two to three players, now have 17, but it's taken a good six, seven years to get to that many players. Uh, obviously, once we get a uh, suitable amount of numbers, like uh, as Sue pointed out, we have uh, 65 players in the equal football division program now, which is fantastic because that feeds into Special Olympics. Um, but perhaps if other programs out there uh, get exposed to us uh, through invitations and meetings and potentially across the board competitions, uh, that is only going to accelerate our growth within the programs. Um, the other things we're looking at through Special Olympics WA and also at a national level is what we call our affiliation programs. Uh, now, Coburn 
uh, which Sue looks after, is actually affiliated to Special Olympics WA, and they're our first football club or local football club that have taken the step towards affiliation. Uh, this provides significant benefits for our players, uh, meaning we can uh, have them attend state games without being registered as Special Olympics athletes via the affiliation program. Um, and then if they decide they really like this and we believe they're suitable, we then invite them to register to Special Olympics to participate at the national level and then the international level from there. Um, uh, we're also looking at come and try days. Uh, we'll be running a few of them through next year, which is, uh, again, it's athletes from example swimming or equestrian within the special Olympics community can come down and try football uh, but they'll also be penned at the uh, com wider community to give them the opportunity to come down and have a try as well um, i suppose the um positives from our environment is um it's community minded it's a uh, very challenging and very rewarding for our athletes um but the biggest part is the community and sense of family that we try to um we try to uh I suppose sell to our athletes and have them involved and most people involved in the programs absolutely love it and love being part of it and that about wraps up special olympics thank you kim i know that uh, linwood united you were talking about the growth going from two to to 17 plays in six years you know that's commitment to the program and uh, the sustainability of it so well done to the club and yourself for um for that commitment to um, efd as well it's really exciting with those Special Olympics events on the horizon. So that's uh, wet the appetite too. We will be throwing back to Chris Barty, or maybe not throwing, passing the football back to Chris Barty. But just an opportunity as well to acknowledge uh, Football Futures Foundation and uh, Melissa Gemina from the team who was really instrumental in assembling our fantastic guest tonight. So a big thank you to, to Football Futures and Melissa. Uh, we'll... we'll Nicely wrap up with Chris and what we've learned and some insights from tonight. Thanks very much. And, and yeah, look, as I said uh, earlier, um, even though I've been involved in, in uh, disability sport for, uh, for a number of years, I always learn, learn something new and, and that's no, no exception, uh, no exception this evening. And I, I think, you know, the example that Raquel, Raquel uh, mentioned before about, you know, the fact that there, that there's a, um, an opportunity to get more more athletes, uh, uh, young athletes with vision impairment involved in football. You know, it's uh, certainly my, my my nugget that I learned tonight that I didn't know before. So I'll be thinking about that tomorrow about how I can how I can take part in that. Um, just really briefly uh, to give an introduction to to cerebral palsy football and a, a quick overview, and I guess a, a plug for our program as well. Um, so uh, the. Cerebral Palsy uh, Football Program uh, is known in, in WA as the WA Paras Program. Uh, it's specifically for athletes with cerebral palsy, uh, acquired brain injury and stroke. So cerebral palsy being an umbrella term for um, people who have uh, had, a, had a, I guess a, a brain trauma um, before the age of a, age of five um, and acquired brain injury people that have been people that have had a, a brain trauma um, through uh, injury or, or illness after the age of five. Um, most of our athletes, even though it is a, a, a neurological disability, will uh, primarily present with a, uh, with physical impairment uh, with their balance mobility um, and and coordination being the primarily impaired factors um, but some of our athletes will also have coexisting conditions like hearing uh, uh, like being hard of hearing deaf um, they might may also have um, uh, an intellectual disability as well um, uh, or some of our athletes have, have had vision impairment um, as well um, but primarily physical disability being the, the, the primary um, uh, impairment I suppose um, our program is um, is a football West state team. Um, so uh, most of our athletes will, will um, play in some form of club football, whether that is in the equal footing ball league um, uh, or in the United Reds league uh, or uh, some of our athletes, particularly as, as they get uh, get older and, and get a little bit more competitive, uh, will start to participate in the Metro Leagues uh, or the Sunday Amateur Leagues. Um, for myself, I played for Jundana um, in, uh, in the Sunday Fourth Division, Sunday League Fourth Division. Uh, float between the reserves and the first team, mostly reserves this year, but um, hopefully you can find my way back into the top side. Um, but uh, as much as possible, we encourage our, our athletes to uh, to transition into a, 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 I guess, what you would call a, a weekly a weekly club program, um, if that's what they would like to do. 
Um, our, our main competitions every year are a, a state championship. So we, last year we had a state championships for the first time, which we um, co-delivered with alongside Special Olympics, which was which was really special. Uh, and from the, our state championships, we use that as a as a pathway to select our state team for the national championships. Uh, and then the national championships is used as um, not only a, a, an opportunity for WA to compete on the national stage, um, but also used for talent identification um, so that uh, athletes who are doing really well um, can be considered for selection for the Pararoos, which is the men's um, cerebral palsy uh, team, which is an official, it's an official FA Football Australia national team. Um, or, um, you know, this year we actually launched the Para Matildas um, for the first time, which is really exciting. And they, they competed and won, won silver um, at the first ever uh, Women's uh, World Cup, which was a terrific achievement. Um, so that's a bit, a bit of an overview of, of our program. Um, we very much adopt, um, as I said, the no wrong pitch approach. So even though we are, um, our version of the game is specifically for athletes with cerebral palsy, acquired brain injury or stroke. Um, if you're good enough to turn up with uh, and, to, and have a run around, um, even if you don't have a target disability, we will, we will absolutely support you to um, uh, find a, a form of the game that, that um, works for you. And once you've done that, you're welcome to continue to come down and have a kick at training. Like we're not going not gonna to turn you away or anything like that. Um, so, uh, and I think for just like everybody else, we're, we're constantly on the lookout for, for new players and, and in my case, new goalkeepers, because I'm getting pretty old and, and need a replacement. So, um, that's, that's something that we're continuing looking to promote. Um, but in terms of this evening's session, and I guess some, just some general takeaways, and I think some reminders um, for, for me is that, um, you know, for any clubs or programs or you know, presidents or coaches or volunteers that are watching tonight and thinking, look, I'd really like to get involved in some form of disability football and, you know, I think it's a really interesting space and, you know, I'd really like to help achieve some of those positive outcomes. But I'm a bit nervous and I don't know the right way to go about it or I, or I don't want to do the wrong thing. Um, don't stress. Um, you know, turning up is a really great first step. Um, and one of the things that you'll find within... Uh, the, the, particularly this, the disability football community is that there are a number of people, um, both in official capacities and in unofficial capacities, that are really willing to catch up, have a coffee, and and help you and provide you with support and advice. We might not be willing to do it for you because we've got our own stuff going on, um, but we'll certainly provide you with with as much support and advice as, as we can. So really encourage you to take those first steps and and reach out if you need to. Um, Something that I always, uh, as well, you know, and I think we've talked about it a number of times, is that, um, look, every person, um, every athlete who turns up has the, capacity, has the capacity to play, has the capacity to participate, um, and has the capacity to, you know, learn and improve. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, just like everybody else, the more we train, the more we play, the higher the standard uh, of, of game and, and the more enjoyment we, we get out of it. So, um, you know, certainly um, what we need to think about is, you know, uh, how can we support support the athlete? Um, and we've spoken a, a number of times about the the athlete themselves being being the expert um, in in their own their own lives. Um, and then finally, you know, we've we've talked about you know a number of ways of, of ways that we can work in with the the disability community to um, you know support the the growth in the various versions of our game. So you know, Raquel talked about you know not only increasing opportunities for for young athletes to play vision impaired football, but talking about you know uh, whether or not there's opportunities for um, mainstream clubs to put on um, to put on the uh, the assistive tech, you know, the the, the visual aid uh, and actually play the form of visual vision impaired football. Um, you know, and, and in vision impaired football at the Paralympic level, the goalkeepers are actually sighted as well. You know, they're, they're not, um, they're, they don't, they, um, they're not uh, vision impaired as it were. So they actually participate by, um, you know, using their voice to support the athletes to know where the ball is and, and, and provide some of that direction. So there's lots of different ways to, to take part. Uh, and then, as Kim mentioned, you know we have um, the the twenty uh, the, the bid for the upcoming um, uh, Special Olympics Games here in, in Perth, and that's going to be a, uh, you know if if the bid is successful, there's going to be lots of opportunities not only to um, uh, for our players to take the field and, and do a really great job, but you know again an opportunity for us to get involved um, as as volunteers, officials, and as clubs to really make this a long lasting legacy. 
So lots of opportunities, I think, is, is probably the key takeaway. So if you are interested in any of the stuff that we've talked about um, tonight, um, make sure you get in touch with a bit uh, at, uh, at Football West or um, with Melissa at Football Futures Foundation um, or any of tonight's guest speakers. Um, and uh, we'll only be too happy to, to walk, walk you through it, push you through it, um, whatever it is that you, you need. So um, thank you very much. Chris, thank you for being such a wonderful ambassador for Football Futures Foundation and uh, and congrats on also being a Pararoo as well, uh, the highest honour. Thank you so so much for having that athlete and football-centred approach to what you brought tonight. And also to our other guests, uh, Raquel Hannon-Williams from Blind Sports WA, Sue Minatillo from Coburn City and also Equal Footing Ball and uh, Kim James from Linwood United Special Olympics and, and Equal Footing Ball. Uh, a fantastic panel. Really hope that you uh, tuning in have found it to be valuable. And by all means, please reach out to us at uh, Football Futures Foundation, Melissa Gamina, of course, and, and also to Football West. We're here to support you. Uh, from Wajak Nunga Buja and uh, paying respects to elders past, present and emerging and, and the lands across WA, uh, we say good night and, and keep smiling, keep scoring. Recording is...